and great. And um, and so uh, one of the things is I, it's amazing how much I forget. Um, I'm starting to enjoy virtual meetings more and more because I miss the human interaction. But we will make this very um, human. Ask questions. Stop me along the way. Um, I got probably one of the best jobs in the world. I get to work with uh, young people, old people. I've uh, been in practice for over 30 years and uh, this field has changed dramatically. Um, and one of the things I got to learn to do is try to how to prevent uh, people from needing me uh, in, in many ways. So uh, uh, thanks for, for joining us. So next slide, please. So an apple a day keeps a doctor away. Um, so it's interesting how we get to different conflicts. Um, and so I had the opportunity to work on different ad boards, speaking for different organizations. Um, and there are some of those, those, those uh, areas. And uh, what I try to do is all the money is collected. I try to put into wellness programs for, for patients at this point in time, or to try to do something a little bit differently. Next slide, please. Um, so we're gonna talk about a little bit of atherosclerosis. How do we score? How do we modify risk? Um, a little bit of you know what life is is a preventive cardiologist um, and uh, and hopefully can answer some questions and uh, what life may be for yourselves in the future. Um, next slide, please. And so uh, if we think about this in atherosclerosis, is that uh, heart disease really starts the day you're you're born. Is that uh, this is it's the interaction between the blood vessel uh, and the endothelium in the vessel wall. Uh, the first phase of um, heart disease really takes place, um, uh, what we call the inner lining or that one layer of thickness endothelium. It's remarkable, it protects uh, what's in the, in the vessels and uh, things like blood pressure, cholesterol, uh, diabetes all damage this and this leads to fatty streaks. In fact, we know at the age of 21, for instance, that the, during the Korean War, uh, soldiers were unfortunately killed uh, Americans at the age of 21. Three quarters of them already had fatty streaks or atherosclerotic plaque. We know from a series of autopsy studies in teenage years, there's already fatty streaks that delve up in the cholesterol uh, deposits in the, in the vessels of the aorta. In fact, during in utero, if you have a genetic cholesterol problem called familiar hypercholesterolemia, the baby develops um, uh, fatty streaks in the aorta before the baby's even born in, in some circumstances. Um, and, Recent data by Valentin Fuster presented in 2020 shows that uh, in Spain, uh, at the age of 30, over three or over a third of people already have uh, atherosclerosis developing. So this is a progressive process. I think we all recognize step four: acute plaque rupture or heart attack, and that's where you present to the hospital. If you look at presentations for heart disease, they can present with angina, chest pains of the heart coming on with exertion lead by rest. It can present with sun deaths in about 20% of the time or a heart attack in 40% of the time. So presenting with angina in the lucky 40 uh, is what we would like to look at this. And the, and the plaque progresses. It's not a linear progression. So let's explore that a little bit more. Look at some of the risk factors. Next slide, please. So. On your top in that purple side is a, a, a vessel that's totally blocked off with just a little bit of blood flow going through that little, right in the middle there, that artery is over 99% blocked. This happens to be familiar hypercholesterolemia in a homozygous individual uh, who lacks no LDL receptors, cholesterol around 25 or so, and develops heart disease uh, 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 before uh, the age of, uh, 10 or 20. On, on the right, you see an atherosclerotic plaque. What you see is that uh, thrombus in the vessel. So atherosclerosis, if you see on the left, is you can see that that plaque, you can see that uh, is that the vessel is probably uh, about 60 or 6% or blocked. You can see that, that that's an eccentric lesion. You can see that there's a thinner endothelium. You can see that there's different inflammatory cells in, in, that, in that plaque. And on the right, you can see that through the thrombus that's taking place in the aorta. So my dad asked me once is that, uh, why don't you just give me some, some Drano for the blood vessels? We can just clean them out. You can see that there's no Drano for this. It's part of the vessel wall. So um, this, is, this, is, this is part of who you are if you develop atherosclerosis. But it's very amenable to, to, to prevention and to um, 
to atherosclerosis treatment. So we can say that the World Health Organization said a number of years ago, excuse me, that 80% of heart disease is preventable. So that's something I, I try to keep in, in the back of my mind. And people will always thank you for being a good doctor for treating their heart attack, but a better doctor is to, to prevent that heart attack from happening in the first place. Next slide, please. So it's interesting, this is actually Framingham. So, um, so what happens is Framingham, Massachusetts, and what happened is in the 1940s, it was decided that what caused heart disease, the leading cause of death. So in 1948, the, the first cohort of individuals, about 5,000 individuals, mostly men to start off with, were, were followed over time and multiple generations took place. So this is, so Framingham, Massachusetts started off with basically blue collar Irish background individuals. And they found that for the first thing that every time you smoke, you lose five to 10 minutes of life, that cholesterol is associated with heart disease, that, the, that high blood pressure, uh, diabetes, and of course, family history increased risk of heart disease. And um, what we learn in North America is that close to 90% of individuals living in North America will probably develop heart disease in their lifetime. Now, what is a lifetime risk of heart disease? Here's one estimation that it's um, a third of women will have heart disease and 50% of males will develop heart disease in some time in their lifetime. Other studies say it's even higher of that, close to 50% of women, 8% of, of males will develop heart disease. On average, um, women develop just as much heart disease, but usually 10 years later compared to their male counterparts. So Framingham um, was started in 1948, great wealth of information. And if you ever give a talk on prevention, you have to give at least one Framingham slide. It's just, it's just a tradition, just kidding about that. But uh, Framingham's been around for a long time and that's where we got our, uh, our knowledge that what, what, what caused heart disease to, to start off with. Next slide, please. So this actually gives a Framingham scoring system. So if you look at any um, preventive strategy, the first thing you have to do is determine level of risk. And the highest risk patients with vascular disease already had a heart attack or stroke. So if you had a heart attack or stroke, you're probably gonna have another one if you don't do something about it. And if you never had a heart attack or stroke, you can use data to calculate this. And this is actually Framingham. So you look at the age of the person. Now Framingham starts off at the age of 30 because they didn't start off with, with kids in their cohort. And they, they found that uh, HDL, cholesterol, systolic blood pressure, presence of smoking or diabetes. Now they say yes or no here, but of course this is actually, um, you know, every time you smoke, you lose uh, five minutes of life. And, and blood sugar is a relationship where hemoglobin E1C greater than five and a half or greater will increase risk of uh, vascular events. Uh, diabetes is defined as a hemoglobin E1C of 6.5 or greater. And that's because we're microvascular complications of diabetes, such as retinopathy, eye problems, um, uh, kidney problems, proteinuria, or end-stage renal disease, or neuropathy, nerve damage starts to take place in hemoglobin A1C uh, north of 6.5 or so, and the higher, the higher that risk is, where heart disease starts somewhere around probably the mid-5 range, low 5 to mid-5 range that, that increases risk of heart disease. So you get these points, you put into a calculator, and you can say, Mr. Jones, Mrs. Smith, your risk of having a vascular event is um, 5%, 2%, 20%, greater than 20%. 30% within the next 10 years of having a heart attack or stroke. Um, the first time I actually um, did this on myself, I was think I was in my early 50s and I found out my, um, because of a family history and high cholesterol, uh, um, my, risk of, uh, my risk of heart disease was higher than I thought. And that you can actually translate to vascular aging. So at 52, I turned out to have the arteries of a 67 year old individual. So I said, hmm, um, I gotta do something about that. So I found that very helpful to, uh, help me on my pathway to better health. Next slide, please. And this is actually a really neat uh, slide, uh, slide that um, you can see the website of, uh, above here. Uh, Paul and his teacher uh, made us aware of this is that you can plug in different things to the equation. You can plug in your risk uh, of heart disease. Now, I kind of like um, the, the, the happy faces and the sad faces and the um, these, these figures and patients kind of, kind of like that as well. So that's a good way of representing uh, your risk of, of heart disease. And you can just see how you can modify risk factors. So if you're a smoker, you stop smoking. Um, if your cholesterol went from six to five, you can change that if you're HDL cholesterol. And you can notice that all risk factors are, uh, is, uh, 
it was, it's a gradual increased risk. It's, you know, the highest risk is, you know, the higher cholesterol, the higher your risk, the lower your cholesterol, lower your risk. It's not yes or no. Um, in Framingham scoring systems, they always made some, you know, like he had diabetes or no diabetes, but it's a, it's a, it's a gradation of risk. So um, it's good to think of risk factors as being continuous variables um, uh, to, to look at this over here, then and you can decide what to do. So if my blood pressure is 160 over, over 100, lowering it to 140 over 80, or what, what will that translate to risk? And this can help you the scoring system. So please play around with it. And, uh, and for your patients in the future, you might find that um, a little bit helpful. Next slide, please. Um, there are multiple scoring systems. You know, um, one of the things is Framingham is basically, I uh, started off in 1948. It's basically predominantly white Caucasian Americans of Irish background. Um, but there's other scoring systems that say from New Zealand, the United States. Uh, um, so whatever one you want to, to take is fine. We traditionally in Canada follow the American approach and use Framingham. Now, Framingham now overestimates risk because that's good. We learn to uh, prevent heart disease better, but still it gives you a scoring system. And you'll find the more junior you are in your career, the more likely you are to use a, frame, uh, a scoring system. As you get more experience, you, you lose less of a use of the scoring system. So I go through periods of time where I use them or I don't use them. But if you already had a heart attack, um, you're, you're going to have another one. There's also enhancing risk factors right now. So you can, if you have vascular disease and you have diabetes, you're in trouble. You have vascular disease and your kidneys don't work. Well, you're in trouble because they're both vascular organs. So there's different ways and there's newer markers such as LP, little a. So you can actually do Framingham Plus if you want, enhancing risk factors. Um, you can see in Framingham, one of the be best predictors is, is age. As you get older, your risk of vascular disease goes up. So Framingham, doesn't really help you very much in a in a in a, a forty year old individual because you don't get that many points because you're young. But most people over the age of you know 65, 70 will be at high risk just based by their age. So um, you always have to take that into consideration. And one of the things I've been moving to is lifetime risk of heart disease. So if you backtrack a slide. Um, you can see that Framingham initially said that you're backtrack one more I'm sorry. Um, uh, one more, I'm sorry, I can't count. Um, but this says that your lifetime risk of um, heart disease for, for, for being born in Canada is at least 50% for a guy and about a third for females. And I can show you the, some data to, to, to double that as well, depending what you look at. So I kind of like lifetime risk more than just 10 year risk, but uh, I think they're both important to, to look at. Well, we'll just move forward a couple slides there. Now, can everybody hear me along the way? Um, and you can talk about uh, good. perfect. Is that uh, is that as you get older, you can't really change that yet. But um, I kind of think the anti-aging formula. If you look at something called the blue zone, um, if you just stay at the slide here for a second, here is that the blue zone is people live to hundred or greater. Uh, kind of things is that they tend to age well. By number one is that they're 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 they're, they're quite skinny. They eat more plant-based eating. Uh, they have a, a low cholesterol, low blood pressure. They're lifelong non-smokers, and they feel useful. They they feel they still contribute. Um, and so that's, that's the beauty thing about careers in uh, in healthcare and medicine is that you are lucky because you can make a difference. And please make a difference. Um, now, uh, um, family history uh, is something to pay attention to. It's a cheap man's genetics. So if you have a family member uh, under the age of, of, of 55 or 65 are having increased risk of heart disease, your risk of heart disease goes up by 30%. If you have two family members, it goes up by 50% or so. Um, and now we can actually do gene, gene testing. If you have an entity, we'll show you about familial hypercholesterolemia present in one in 200 people in Ontario. Um, your risk is three times higher for the same cholesterol of having a vascular event, just because your cholesterol has been high all your life and cholesterol tends to rise as we get older. Yes, you can modify your weight. And what's turning out to be is that the new smoking is because smoking rates have, have gone down. An individual will smoke will lose five to 10 minutes of life. 50% uh, of people will smoke will, will die related to their tobacco uh, uh, habits. Um, so, um, is that we really, we still have to 
work on uh, smoking sensation. Uh, and if you're gonna use smoking to control weight, I'd rather you be overweight than smoke. But saying that uh, we need to control weight right now because you know, ideal body mass index is somewhere between 18.5 and 25. What we learned from COVID is that a body mass index over 25 increases your risk of being hospitalized and unfortunately dying from heart disease. And if you have a body mass index over 40, um, and I, we, there's different ways of classifying weight, but body mass index is sort of the, probably the, the best way to look at that, knowing a person's height and their weight, uh, you can actually calculate that quite easily. And, then, and for my colleagues in bariatric surgery, if you have a body mass index over 40 and it's persistent, then the bariatric surgery may be the best solution for you, but uh, at the time for different discussions. So um, inactivity, um, man oh man is that um, uh, when in the past when Paul was working with me, we used to do the stairs, the um, uh, CN Tower climb. And I promised Paul that uh, anytime he wants to climb the CN Tower, um, uh, I'd be glad to to, to sponsor him. Um, I don't know if he ever has gone faster than myself, but he should be able to. I'm just an old guy. Um, but uh, um, I, I did. I went to the stairs about three times last week. I'm only walking them. So Paul, we have to get out and start running them again right now. I have to get back into training one point in time. So um, is that for every one met increase in activity and fitness, mortality from heart disease falls about five to 10%. So most of us can actually increase our fitness by uh, two to four mets quite easily. And it's the difference between spending um, a quality time at home or quality time in the, in the retirement setting in a nursing home or, or whatever. So uh, I really believe in the fountain of youths about activity is that uh, Alzheimer's disease is a deadly disease and it rips quality of life from families. And it looks out being active, activity is one of the best ways to help delaying that as much as you can. Diet, well, diet's a cornerstone of, of lifestyle changes. We'll explore that a little bit more. Um, hypertension uh, and diabetes are also important risk factors. But interesting is that if you look at pathogenesis of atherosclerosis, oxidized LDL cholesterol is a major contributing factor and that's a major target of preventing atherosclerosis through uh, diet, weight reduction, certain medications can all make a big impact on this. So these are things to think about. These are the, the, the number one risk factors. Yes, there is more, more emerging risk factors um, and enhancing risk factors. But if you think about that approach, how to take care of that, and uh, it's important as well. And we haven't even talked about the psychological benefits of, uh, of, of being healthy. And uh, uh, the longest, I think it's the Harvard study that looked at uh, uh, the longest trial, of who, who lives in long, longest, and it turns out to be number of quality relationship that you have. So healthcare gives you the opportunity to have um, um, quality relationships with, with patients um, and with other family members as well, but also uh, takes away quality relationships because you have to spend so much time looking after other people as well and uh, finding that balance. I'm probably not the right person to ask because I still have to make a few more phone calls afterwards to some, some patients and uh, um, uh, I, I started around uh, six thirty this morning, so uh, still going strong and uh, still looking forward to this. And if all goes well, I'll do some stairs tonight afterwards. Uh, next slide, please. And you're all welcome to come join us. So here's a case: sixty-nine-year-old gentleman. Um, you're asked to see, um, and, and this person has a body mass index of thirty-one. Remind you that ideal body mass index is between. 18 and a half and 25. He keeps telling you he's going to um, uh, become more physically active. And uh, like many people is that uh, less than 20 to 25% of people do uh, meaningful activity on a regular basis. Um, fast foods, well, when I was growing up and I had my young kids, I used to define fast foods for uh, my, my young kids as it made you run fast. And that was basically things like uh, fruits and vegetables, apples and things of that nature. Um, and kids are actually very amenable to change prior to going to school. Uh, so you can do a lot of changing kids behavior before at uh, the age of 70 years of age. Um, so once they get after the first or second grade, it's uh, society takes over and their peer pressure takes over. So spend a lot of time with young people to change their behaviors. A guy called Valentin Fuster doing projects in, in, in Spain using sesame characters and things to change uh, kids' behavior and family behaviors. And what you do is you treat the entire family with sesame characters at a young age and, 
and the parents and the grandparents are healthier as well. Um, we know that LDL stands for lousy cholesterol, HDL for healthy cholesterol. And then there's also triglycerides, or triglycerides we'll talk about. Uh, and this person has diabetes. So unfortunately diabetes, it, it doubles your vascular risk. Um, and, uh, and we talk about pack your smoking. So um, um, unfortunately many people in the past living in, in the Hamilton area start smoking at the age of 13, 14. And, uh, and we smoke a pack a day for a year with a pack year history. So if you smoke two packs a day uh, for 24 years, you accumulate a 48 year pack year history. If you smoke a pack of cigarettes a day um, for 48 years, you uh, accumulate um, that amount of pack year history. And it becomes important because once you accumulate greater than about 30 pack year history, 20 to 30 pack year history, you're much higher likely to have a developed chronic obstructive lung disease. And that's a, that's a disease of cough, sputum production. Um, and after the age of 25 years of age, your lung functions start to deteriorate. So you wanna keep your lungs healthy and the best way to keep your health healthy is to not smoke um, and to keep exercise. So you have that, that decline of um, lung function that's reduced. So asymptomatic angina or silent ischemia, um, uh, can be detected by a stress test. Uh, and uh, and uh, so cardiologists like myself are trying to figure out how much heart tissue is at risk and that's the best approach. Uh, one, of the, one of the shifts that we're gonna go is said defining how much heart disease you have is concentrating more on prevention. We seem to get more value for that type of approach. Next slide, please. But for many people, they need to understand where their heart lies and how much heart tissue is at risk. So we have modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors so you can see that uh, you can't change your age. Um, you can change your gender, but that doesn't change your risk of heart disease. In fact, people who are transgender have a much higher risk of heart disease. Um, um, and as you get over the age of um, 45 to 55, your risk starts to become steep. And we and uh, so to me, um, uh, women catch up to, to males for risk of heart disease, usually after the, around the menopause. Um, at one time, we used to prescribe hormone replacement therapy, including myself, um, that I thought hormones, well, they lowered LDL cholesterol, they're thrombogenic and recreate risk of cancer. They actually cause heart disease. So uh, what you'll find over your careers are that uh, what you think you know today will be wrong tomorrow. So um, uh, case in point, uh, my mother, when she was pregnant with myself and my brother, she was told by her nice family doctor that she should have a cigarette uh, to calm her nerves. Well, we learned that was wrong. Um, in, in my lifetime, is that I, I started treating with hormone replacement therapy to prevent heart disease. I found out that was wrong. I actually increased the risk of heart disease. So I'm learning and learning. Um, and one of these things in careers in medicine is that this fascination of constantly learning over time is uh, very important. Um, next slide, please. So we have, you can actually use genetics right now. And one of the things is polygenic scores. Um, so polygenic scores are basically interactions of, of about 500 genes all playing a role. And that's actually coming of age for cancer, for heart disease, and for other disease processes. Uh, maybe there'll be a polygenic score for brain power. Um, unfortunately, I have a very high polygenic score for cholesterol and triglycerides. So I'm from the top two to three percentile for cholesterol and triglycerides. And, I have an entity called familiar combined hyperlipidemia where it affects cholesterol and triglycerides. So that was um, 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 uh, more emphasis in this over here. So, so you're gonna see more of that. So the, the advantage of this, the early in life, you can actually figure out your, your lifetime risk of heart disease and appropriate uh, therapies. Next slide, please. Or you can have the quiet Leonard's in the world. Or so if you look at the Toronto Raptors, it can be a bunch of you know, you know, good bench players, that's the polygenic score. You can have one dominant player like Kawhi Leonard uh, on your team. And uh, basically, female hypercholesterolemia is a disease affecting the LDL receptor uh, through multiple pathways, something called PSK9, Apple B, or LDL receptors. And you can use these tendon anthomas, this arcus. So every couple months, I, I look at people's eyes and I can see this arcus and D or this xanthalasm and, and, and C. So, uh, just last week, this person thought I was a genius because uh, he, for the first time I said, you know what, you have female hypercholesterolemia by just looking at your eyes. And how do you know that? Well, uh, I know these pictures. Um, and you can see them in the tendons in the hands. And so um, 
one in roughly 200 to 250 Canadians have an LDL cholesterol above five. If you have an LDL cholesterol above five and LDL total, your risk of heart disease is extremely, uh, extremely, extremely high. So, so the genetics right now and uh, the therapies are, are, are just changed. And genetics have revolutionized both cholesterol and now triglycerides as well. So that plays a role. So whatever field of medicine you take, learn immunology uh, and learn um, about genetics and how that can play a role. So that's really an emerging strategy. And when I went to medical school, genetics didn't play a large role. It plays a huge role right now. Next slide, please. Now the modifiable risk factors, you can, next slide, uh, you can work on your weight. So, um, you know, to me, this is the hardest risk factor to modify. You can see for every, there's a 29% increased risk in cardiovascular disease for every five units increase in body mass index. So you can see that uh, losing 20 pounds for many people overweight uh, can translate to reduction in, in, in the heart attacks in something called the look ahead trial. Um, and diabetes. So to me, is concentrating and spending importance on the weight. And we as a society haven't done a very good job. We as healthcare providers have not done a good job. The, the most success right now is in bariatric surgery and in intense lifestyle changes um, that people meet on a, on a regular basis, usually in a group once a week or so. Uh, there are things like liquid diets of Optifast. If you ever get a chance, you can look at our, 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 our um, our YouTube site that Paul was kind enough to start in his old life. Um, and uh, it wasn't for Paul, we wouldn't have this website. And it tells you the power of collaboration is just working together and getting everybody better. Uh, Paul is a great example of that. And I want to thank him for that. And that losing weight is something Paul did, I did, you can do too as well. And you can help your, your patients uh, over time with that as well. Next slide, please. So that's an important risk factor, it explains everything. Um, you know, there's, there's so much information about uh, activity. So I think in METs, one MET is your basic metabolic rate at 3.5 cc's per oxygen uptake per kilogram per minute. It's how you convert oxygen into horsepower. Um, and, and also the difference, you need about five METs of activity to do daily activities such as going shopping, walking around the house, maybe cutting your grass with an electric mower. And once you're hospitalized, you lose so much fitness. So to me, you wanna be functioning um, at over um, 12 mets. Ideally, this says, you know, um, eight and, and 11 mets. So the more horsepower, the more mets you have. So people who have, who have can do 12 mets of activity uh, have a low chance of dying from heart disease over the next few years, regardless of risk factors. So that's important. So fitness can do a lot. And we need both um, um, aerobic activity, some anaerobic activity, and some resistance training as well. So uh, please take the time to be physically active um, um, or come join us on any of our events and love to see you there anytime. Next slide, please. So diet, diet is a cornerstone of therapy. This is the new food guideline. You can take a look at it. You can see that half your plates are fruits and vegetables, that uh, you want to have uh, the number one beverage is now water. Uh, at one time we used to use a lot of dairy products, but now we're replacing that with water, fruits and vegetables, uh, more plant-based eating as much as you can, um, uh, and more high fiber foods. 60% of calories that most of us eat are processed, avoid the processed foods. If you can't pronounce them, and you can't see them, you can't pick them off a tree, you can't grow them somewhere, uh, be careful. Um, is that uh, so this is something, and, and diets are very, controversial areas, so much to learn. So I'm trying to eat more fruits and vegetables. And my number one source of uh, uh, protein right now comes from beans. Um, the gas production goes up, but your health gets better too as well. Next slide, please. And there's different diets. This is called the DASH trot, dietary approach to stopping hypertension uh, designed by the NIH. You can actually lower blood pressure by about 11 or five millimeters of mercury by modifying your diet, more fruits and vegetables, which are rich in potassium, uh, which would and we play and low increasing potassium uh, for fruits and vegetables, lower blood pressure, low fat dairy has been shown to lower blood pressure and having high fiber foods and maintaining uh, ideal body weight um, and eating much less protein compared to what we have to do. And of course, the salt consumption. Well, salt is controversial. Uh, the development of hypertension is partly salt mediated and salt and sweetness takes good. So uh, I think there's lots of, um, most of us sit, Sit in the, uh, sit to try to eat less than two grams of sodium a day. 
uh, average Canadians eating two to three times that much. If you just look at um, a can of soup for many people, that's your almost your daily requirements of salt if you're not careful. Um, uh, next slide, please. That's one of the diets. The most popular diet is a Mediterranean diet, um, and, and certainly is that uh, is is uh, I, I won't go through that in any more detail, but just saying it's it's a good healthy diet. It's uh, uh, probably plant-based in its background, lots of high fiber foods in there and uh, very little meat uh, at all. Um, and unfortunately, not very much in the way of desserts or, or fast foods. Next slide, please. So our poor patients there, um, uh, and one of the things that people have gone to is plant-based eating. Some people feel it can actually cause some regression on a coronary angiogram. Dean Orange has shown this in a very small trial. Uh, it's a good healthy diet. I become predominantly a plant-based eater uh, because I think it's good for the animals, it's good for the planet, and there's certainly some health benefits. Um, but, um, and one of the things I learned is alcohol along the way is a type one carcinogen, it's rich in calories. So uh, it brings on atrial fibrillation if you're at tendency to, to do this, it accelerates certain cancers, and it certainly gains a lot of weight. So when, at one time we said alcohol was good for the heart. In fact, now we know that alcohol is bad for the heart, especially for things like triglycerides and for uh, atrial fibrillation. So, and for high blood pressure and probably for Alzheimer's disease as well, certain cancers. So that's a different change in our thinking process. Now, it doesn't mean you can't drink. And I think drinking less than four drinks a week is not unreasonable for, for most individuals, but it, uh, it's not a health benefit. It's a, it's a pleasure benefit. And um, um, so, those, so that's a reversal of, of, of training. Uh, of what we learned. Unfortunately, um, during the COVID pandemic in Ontario, uh, alcohol stores are considered an essential service because we have a drinking problem in Ontario. Um, and we need to think about how to, to ask things like the CAGE questionnaire and how to figure out if people's health are affected by alcohol. For, and, and that can be a very confrontational area for, for many patients. So just kind exploration about alcohol intake should be part of something to think about in your functional inquiry. Next slide, please. Um, cholesterol, well, cholesterol, we talked about high triglycerides, low HDL. Um, there's a new kid on the block is LP little a. It's a, it's a, it's a new form of atherosclerotic molecule that we're learning about. We're going to have some, some therapies for that in the future. We learned the, the field of LDL cholesterol has been around for a long time. It could be small or dense. All LDL cholesterol is bad. And basically, you can lower your risk of heart disease by 60% uh, easily. Uh, by uh, reducing cholesterol very aggressively. Here's the meta-analysis of over 300,000 patients um, with atherosclerosis for every 1 million more reduction of heart disease, vascular events fall just over uh, 23% and 10% fatal events. So if you start off, let's say, with an LDL cholesterol of um, 4 and bring it down to 1, you lower LDL cholesterol uh, by three units, that's a 60% reduction of vascular events. At one time, we thought once you had an LDL cholesterol less than two, you're done. Well, going from two to one, you lower your risk another 20% and even below that. So I take pride in uh, getting people's cholesterol uh, less than one in very high risk patients. And if I can make it undetectable in some people, I'm very happy to do that. And the European guidelines last year are probably the most up-to-date right now. Canadian guidelines were updated in 2016. They're going to come out again in 2021. If you just backtrack one slide there, this is um, uh, some of the trials we looked at. Uh, the Jupiter was one trial that just 20 milligrams of atorvastatin lowers risk of vascular disease by 40% in patients who didn't have a high cholesterol. Ezetimide is sort of the backup agent. Um, uh, that can actually contribute to lowering LDL cholesterol. Statins can lower LDL cholesterol between 40 to 60% depending on your dose. Is that a might between 15 to 25%? Now, it said that diet can lower cholesterol up to 30%. That's in people that are very susceptible to diet. Most people have about a 5 to 10% reduction in LDL cholesterol with diet. Next slide, please. You can see there's so much to say. Uh, and here's the lipid guidelines that talks about levels of risk. Um, and... Um, and to me, the very high risk patients who had a more than vascular event over the last couple of years, I will lower the other cholesterol to less than one. Um, and if your level um, 
if, if you if you're a healthy person, then you don't you're not as aggressive in management of cholesterol. Next slide, please. So we calculate using Framingham scoring system to look at this. Now HDL cholesterol stands for healthy cholesterol. Um, often HDL and triglycerides go hand in hand, and it looks like right now is HDL is a is a, is a marker for risk but not a target of therapy. About 20 years ago, we actually infused something called HDL Milano into people. We actually gave drugs to boost HDL cholesterol, but was disappointing that it didn't translate to reduction in cardiovascular events. You are now looking at the triglyceride part of the equation with remnant particles causing atherosclerosis at this point in time. And so a triglyceride greater than 1.5 increases your risk at this point in time. And the, uh, that's been a new areas of exploration. So LDL cholesterol is king, but remnant particles with uh, triglycerides are also important as well. Next slide, please. Uh, high blood pressure has been around for a long time. Somewhere up to 90% of Canes will develop hypertension. Uh, there's clear relationships lowering blood pressure down to 120 systolic and recent meta-analysis of 600,000 patients in randomized controlled trials was presented at the European Cardiology Meeting in August 2000 and 20 showing for every 10 million reduction of blood pressure, there's a reduction in mortality, vascular mortality by 10%, 20% reduction in um, heart attacks and about a 30% reduction in strokes and congestive heart failure. It turns out because we've managed heart disease better, you don't die from your heart disease. And one of the things that's happened in my lifetime, heart disease mortality has decreased dramatically. When I started practice, if you had a bypass surgery and you lived 10 years, that was a wonderful achievement. Now you can easily live 20 years plus if you take care of yourself. Um, if you had a heart attack, you had an 80% chance you would die from heart disease. Now the trial shows you have heart disease with good aggressive therapy, um, only between 30 to 50% of people will die from heart disease. They'll die from that, and that, that other non-cardiac causes right now. We've done, we've done really good things with diets and lifestyle changes such as the DASH dry, the Mediterranean dry, or plant-based eating. But lowering blood pressure is a key risk factor. And most of us become complacent um, and we don't, we're not as aggressive as we, we can be. And patients don't ask for, for more medication. What you have to learn about blood pressure to achieve blood pressure control in many patients it's probably two or three medications at times. So not be afraid to do that. Uh, single drug therapy for hypertension uh, will work for uncomplicated really hypertension, but for real true blue hypertension, combination therapy is a way to look at it. Next slide, please. And home blood pressure measurements are probably the best for, for, for most of us um, because the office blood pressure does go up and learning how to measure blood pressure properly is something you'll do in your lifetime. Next slide, please. Always measure when you're relaxed. Diabetes increased risk of heart disease at least by double, sometimes even higher. It's associated with remnant particles, glycosylation of uh, lipids. Uh, it just causes a lot of bad things. It's, uh, it's a nasty uh, contributor. It's one of the best fertilizers for atherosclerosis. So being attentive to, to weight. And one of the most important things is trying to keep yourself at a body mass index of 20 to 25. I know that's hard, but you know what? It took me about 60 years to get there. I'm there. I'll keep struggling to stay at that level. Um, and uh, so diabetes is a contributing factor. It turns out that lowering blood sugar very aggressively only lowers the risk of a heart attack by 10 to 15%, but more importantly, lowering blood pressure and cholesterol in diabetics leads to much more meaningful reduction in cardiovascular events. So again, lowering blood pressure, a 10 millimeter reduction of, of, of blood pressure you, you prevent 20% of heart attacks and 30% of strokes and congestive heart failure for a 1 million reduction of LDL cholesterol, vascular events fall by 20%. It's amplified in diabetes because diabetes doubles your risk on average. Next slide, please. And we have different agents. Uh, metformin has been around for a long time. We have about 10 different categories of medications. We have newer kids on the gl glucagon agonist, SGL3 receptor antagonist, they have special properties beyond their, their blood sugar lowering that protects the heart. And those are new findings that we found in the last uh, few years or so. Who would have thought called an SGL2 receptor antagonist with the drug that causes you to pee out a can of Coke or, or sugared water in your urine every day translates to reduction in congestive heart failure by about 25%. Um, Glucone agonists are probably the, the best medications to help promote weight reduction with uh, diabetes. Now, sulfonylureas, DPP inhibitors are probably neutral from, from heart disease, uh, but they lower blood sugar and they have their appropriate use in the right patients. They've been around 
uh, especially sulfonylurea has been around for a long time. Uh, they're effective lowering your blood sugar and it helps against microvascular complications and making people feel better. The advantage of these medications, we know them, uh, uh, they're relatively inexpensive. The downside, they, def, they do cause more weight re reduction and people prone to hypoglycemia. We have to be leery about this. So, so much to do with diabetes is no longer a disease for one physician because it causes kidney disease, eye disease, uh, feet disease, heart disease. So it's a, it's a, it's, any, anybody who treats patients will have to worry about diabetes in their lifetime. Next slide, please. Smoking, nothing good about smoking. Every time you smoke five to 10 millimeters of uh, tobacco uh, or what, each cigarette will, will lower heart disease. Interheart suggests that reducing um, uh, tobacco helps. If you can't stop, smoke less. Uh, for people smoke, put on a Nicorette patch for a month and you'll probably smoke less and you'll probably be better off. Um, smoking has a lot of events, uh, atherosclerotic effects that you can see listed here from inflammation to uh, enhancing oxidation of, uh, of particles, uh, bad thing. So uh, the only thing that's, there's nothing good about smoking. Next slide, please. Um, now this happens to be a, uh, what you do when you have a heart attack or your, your ischemia, the trial called the ischemia trial showing that um, uh, patients who have lots of ischemia on a stress test that revascularization, things like bypass surgery and angioplasty weren't all that effective in preventing heart disease. Who would have thought? You, you have blocked arteries, you should, you know, 90% blocked arteries, you should fix it. Well, more importantly, you should, you should protect that lesion with the risk factors we talked about. However, when you cross the, the paths to uh, complete where you have an acute coronary syndrome, you have a a fresh thrombus in your artery, those patients require an intervention. So we know that the best time to have an angioplasty is when you're having a heart attack. Um, treating uh, ischemia with angioplasty or bypass surgery release symptoms and improves quality of life, but doesn't really give you much in the way of survival advantages. And that's actually new thinking that just came out in the last couple of years or so. It's the body of information that's been evolving over time. So. In the past, the revascularization trials done in the 60s and 70s showed that bypass surgeries for three vessel disease or left main disease made you live longer. Uh, now, uh, what shows to make you live longer is what your cholesterol, blood pressure, smoking, your weight, and other risk factors are more important. Who would have thought? Um, and that's how things have changed. Next slide, please. You're getting a whole course in, in, in cardiology. Now, the, the new kid in the block is um, fish oils. So what we learned that if, if, if you... Um, Go to um, by uh, Jameson's um, omega three, or you got uh, omega something, whatever. Uh, all you're doing is that you're part of a multi billion dollar industry helping the people sell the vitamins, make money. The only and uh, we learned uh, that uh, the only beneficial effect of fish oil is something called pure EPA. So uh, those who know biochemistry, omega-3s are essential fatty acid. There are three major types, um, DHA, EPA, and alpha-linoic acid. There's other variations of that. The alpha-linoic acid is a vegetable form of it um, that's weakly translated. Uh, things like you know, canola, quinoa, uh, and flax have higher concentrations, good healthy foods. But uh, EPA is good for the heart, reduces the cardiovascular events by 25%. In a trial called Strengths, um, um, the combination of EPA and DHA are, are, are totally neutral for heart disease protection. And it, it looks like uh, DHA is good for the eyes and the, and, 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 and the brain, EPA is good for the heart. So this is an evolving concept. The final chapter is not written here, but this is important because EPA probably prevents oxidation of LDL cholesterol, the bad guy in acid plaque. It also stabilizes membranes. So Trump has built a, a wall between Mexico and the United States. Um, and uh, basically, if you have a wall with EPA, it, it's actually a more resistant wall. If you have a wall with DHA, it's a more porous wall and a more acid plaque can maybe penetrate that. But these are concepts that we're learning about. Um, and it's just something that I, I would never pick that, uh, you know, that, that fish oils where I thought when, you, you know, a number of years ago, I've been quoted in many newspapers that uh, I would recommend a thousand milligrams of DHA and EPA. I now recommend 4,000 milligrams of pure EPA in people with high triglyceride risk of heart disease. And that final chapter is still not written right now. Um, 
So we have lots to learn. So really exciting. This makes medicine so wonderful. Next slide, please. Uh, so preventive cardiology, you know, a, a good physician treats heart disease. And it's interesting that uh, I, um, I picked cardiology because it was, it, it had a lots of things to, um, um, to be exciting. Lots of things were happening. Um, when I was at uh, uh, a younger life, um, a lot of the best things to me happened by accident. I, I always was a hard worker like you are. Um, and um, and I went to medical school at uh, at McGill, and uh, I did some uh, did a summer elective in in um, uh, in Saint Anthony's in in, in in Newfoundland. What happened was there was something called the Grenfell Missions, and in, in my booklet of uh, electives, there was a Grenfell mi uh, Mission. My dad was born in Quarterbrook, so I consider myself uh, part Newfie. I want to go back, and if I went for eight weeks, I had free room and board. So being a poor medical school room and board. Um, I got to go there and, uh, and, and I spent my whole summer holidays there. I went back multiple times. I felt useful for the first time as a medical student. And I met up with a, a, a cardiologist from Yale that wanted to get away. Uh, and he um, said some nice things about me. And I went to uh, Connecticut, one of the Yale affiliates and got to spend three years in the States and learned a lot there. And, uh, and so uh, that was in general internal medicine. And then I said, well, I want to come back to, to Canada or I stay in the States. So um, I initially started off in the McGill system. I spent some time in Newfoundland. I spent some time in Connecticut. And I came to McMaster. And the, the strengths of anybody's training is uh, working together, variation, working with different systems. You know, um, McGill gave me the idea, see one, do one, teach one. It was sort of like the Montreal Canadiens of hockey at that point in time. You're in awe of McGill, all the 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 legends of McGill. So I felt in awe of that. When I was in Connecticut, in Connecticut, I was in awe of all the, uh, I met the person who described toxic shock syndrome. I met the person who gave the first steroids to, hu to human beings. So I met some, some legends in that way. So McGill was a great um, teaching institution and, uh, and you sort of expectation. Yale was uh, American medicine at its finest. McMaster is evidence-based medicine. Um, everything fits into the box. So if you were at Yale, you wouldn't like McMaster because there was no evidence. You were the person who, who, who invented toxic shock, described it, or, or gave pregnizone to, to the first human being, where McMaster is taught me about evidence-based medicine, how to evaluate different things. And McGill, you were expected to be the best. So therefore you were the best as sort of the, the feelings there. So my advice to everybody is to learn in different places and, um, and to get the best of every world. So um, um, I, I went into cardiology. I was told 30 something years ago, cardiology was a full subspecialty. Um, you know what? It wasn't full then, it's not full now today, uh, but it's changing. So uh, that becomes an important, follow your dreams and, 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 and your passion. Uh, and uh, next slide, please. So um, to me, um, my days are, are long. I, get up around you know five in the morning I go on the internet I read the medical post and look at a few emails um, um, after a couple cups of coffee I keep saying I was in the summertime I'll go for a walk with the dog but in the winter time uh, I'll just go in, in my electric car and by the way get an electric car at some point in time Elon Lutz is, is, is a miracle person I never saw a car get better um, and I'm trying to get better too as well, so it can drive itself with your with your assistance. Um, it's a truly remarkable vehicle, but um, important. It just taught me that uh, being innovative and trying new things and not be afraid to. Um, Elon Musk is a person who uh, blew up a number of rockets, was running out of money. He spent his last twenty or thirty million on his last rocket. It worked. Um, if it didn't work. Um, uh, um, I think all of us are in debt coming out of medical school and things of that nature, but it's, you know, it's a great journey. Um, and, and medicine is not a good return on a financial investment. Medicine is a good return on doing something useful and exploring um, healthcare in some way. It's been a, a fabulous thing. And uh, you are going to work harder than most people. You know, there's no substitute for hard work. Patients need you when they're sick and you need to be available. So I spent a lot of time in, in, um, in the hospital. In my early life, I was a director of a coronary care unit. Um, 
I got to be director of the Lipid Clinic for a while. I got to see the explosion of statins, a brand new class of medication. And I was taking different parts of the world to learn about this brand new thing called statins way back when. It was a, it was a game changer. I remember the 4S trial when it came out. This is the first trial that lowering cholesterol translates to reduction of mortality from heart disease. That was a game changer. Since then, cholesterol has become a mature field. It's one of the easiest things to prescribe uh, statin therapy. Um, and uh, now we have a new entity about statin intolerance. We turned out is that it's probably uh, a disease that called the nocebo effect in nine out of 10 times. And uh, if you ever get a chance to look at um, our videos on, on YouTube, you'll, you'll, you'll see some of that. So right now, if you Google statin and soreness, you have 3 million hits. Um, all saying what a bad doctor you are for prescribing a statin and uh, why wouldn't you take a natural something like omega-3s that are totally useless but make somebody else rich um uh, next slide please so it's you know and you're always um, learning yeah sorry yeah so for dr kearney i was actually hoping you could describe for the students um what a day you know you mentioned you wake up really early 5 a.m what's a typical day look like for you as well like um, as the day progresses yeah. towards the night dude so in my earlier days, I would go to the, I'd be in the emergency room at 6.30 in the morning, take over, um, I'd hear the residents and the medical students present the cases of the day. Um, and then we go to morning report at eight o'clock, then we'd uh, round on the patients, see the patients. I would usually run off to my office around noontime for a little bit to see a few patients, come back at around two o'clock and do the same thing again, then go back to my office at five o'clock and around nine o'clock I'd burp and come home. Uh, and start again. Um, and maybe I I'd do some stairs, maybe I'd run around a little bit. As uh, And at, at one time you spent some days in the hospital, some days in your office. Um, as hospital life got busier and busier, you really couldn't actually divide up your time. And that was one of the, the sad parts about um, managing inpatient and outpatient. If you have an outpatient practice, you have uh, employees, you have to become a business person. And uh, you can't just tell your employees you're not going to be working uh, for part of the year and things of that nature. So it becomes a, a challenge and you want your patients to be there when you need to. So, um, and so managing between in and out of hospital was always something I, I did for about uh, uh, 25, 30 years and enjoyed it immensely. Um, I love the excitement of being in a hospital, being part of a team, but I also love the satisfaction of relationship building with patients long term. And I feel right now that many physicians don't do both as well as they can because, you know, to be a good inpatient physician, you have to be there. To be a good outpatient physician, you have to be there. And how do you divide yourself and, and work with that way? So now people are working in different teams and different structures to make that work. But to be honest with you, the patients want to see the, their doctor, not any doctor. And you want to be available for your doctor. So I struggled all my life to try to balance those little things. I don't think I ever found the true balance. But the joy is um, being involved in people, the relationships you develop over 25 years and some people. And it's something that um, 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 I feel good when someone can call me. Um, I have this cell phone that I, I don't know how many people know my number. It seems like the whole world does. Most people don't abuse it. Um, and uh, most people call for the right times. Now with virtual medicine taking a hold is that it's even changed that. So your days off, if you look at my, my Sunday, Saturday, I'm not supposed to be working, um, but we're gonna call about 20 people that morning just on my day off just to see how they're doing for uh, and, and like that. So, you know, to me, it's exciting is that they're working together, but also too, it's also tiring as well. So there's no room for other things as well. So watching my kids grow up, I, I went to their hockey games and to all their sports team, they got to sponsor them. Uh, I would always be the last one there. And during the intermission, I'd be on my computer trying to figure something out, whether people would be talking about life, I'd just be going back to my work. And I don't regret any of that at all. And, uh, but it, 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 uh, if you're going to be in acute medicine, you'll be a cardiologist is that, you know, I'm sorry, Mr. Jones, you're having your heart attack. It's not a good time for me to deal with you. You just can't do that. Um, if you're an invasive cardiologist, that means you have to go in at two o'clock in the morning. Um, if, if you're a preventive cardiologist, you can do things a little bit different, but you do a little bit, if you're in the coronary care unit, you have to be available and drop everything uh, at times and just be there. Very interesting. What do you do when it's time of change or shift? You know, you're 
you're you're working from you know you know you're supposed to be working from eight to five. I don't know of many doctors that work eight to five. So my eight to five starts at, at 6.30 and uh, you have a problem at uh, 4.35. You leave it for the person on call, you take care of it. Well, uh, you usually take care of it. And then, and then you're late for um, um, your kid's hockey game or your, the date with your spouse and things of that nature as well. Uh, and you have to have very uh, individuals. I, I have the, one of the wonderful uh, uh, my wife is a wonderful lady who expects me to never be on time um, most of the time. She just said the day we got married, I should be on time. So I was actually the first one there. I was there with my brother, who was my best mind. We were there two hours before the wedding. So I know that's one time I was on time. There must have been a second time. I'm not quite sure when that, that was. But I hope to be late for my funeral as well. Um, um, and so, um, so it t to me is that... Uh, you know, life is busy, but it's very fulfilling most of the time. Yes, you get overwhelmed. Yes, you're going to get burnt out at periods of time. And yes, you have to find um, other aspects of your things. But basically, the number one joy is doing things for people when they least expect it. And, and that gives great joy. Uh, and then next slide, please. It's constant learning all the time, you know, as that, um, and, uh, you know, what type of career you're going to pick. Important is do something useful and go where you need it. I, I say this, if you know, if there's 10,000 cardiologists in a place and you're 10,000 first cardiologist, I'm just not sure you're gonna be as happy as uh, the middle of nowhere that has been looking for a cardiologist for five years. You can do more useful work and working in collaboration, community versus academics. Um, you know, a lot of good community places do such wonderful work. Sometimes academic, get uh, research gets in the way of patient care so how do you balance these sorts of things and uh, but also the the learning um in academics is, is wonderful the quizzing all the time um paul was listening to um uh one of our gurus rob Hegley, present on um updates on on cholesterol dhnep a fascinating story which i'll share with you a little bit and the, the final chapter is not written in it i'm enjoying the exploration i've gone back to try and understand basic biochemistry I almost understand what, it, what, what uh, omega-3 fatty acid chemical structure looks like again. And I haven't thought about that for 20 years and it's kind of nice to, to think about that. Um, so to me is that uh, there are so many good choices and I think most physicians and physicians in training would be happy in five different areas. Um, um, and how you pick is, is a really um, challenging area. Next slide, please. But to me, the thing is that uh, how do you balance work and life? If you ever find that balance and you're not a good physician in my mind, is that you, you can't give enough to life to participate in life, you can't give enough to your patients. And so how do you balance that in some way? So you have to figure a way to do that. And yes, you can do it. Um, um, it's uh, more rewarding. Yes, there'll be times when you need, you are burnt out. And um, now they say that doctors um, have a higher suicide rate, higher divorce rate. Um, um, but it's also, um, I don't know what percentage of people really love what they do. I don't think it's that high. I think many physicians really love what they do and medicine allows that opportunity to do that. But it is um, very committed in time and resources and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and yeah, you have to still have that passion um, to keep learning 30 years later. I look at some of the people around me who work in different jobs and different areas they haven't seen that much change. Um, there's constant change right now. Um, and, and that's important as well. Um, next slide, please. I, I hope we remain a, a, a profession and not that uh, we're not irreversible or not replaceable. Uh, when they want to see you, Dr. Jones or Dr. Peter or Dr. Paul, Dr. Alexandra, um, they want to see you. They don't want to see the person on call. And um, how are you going to make yourself available to them at the right place and right time? And only you can can look at this. So, to me, is that you know do the things that you love that you can explore. It's going to take five times much more work to do things as possible. Learn to work with other people. If you're going to start off and be a, a family doctor, uh, if you want to set up your own fa family practice for the first time, or you're going to be a rheumatologist and set it up, good luck. Uh, there's a lot of smart people along the way know a much better job how to do that. So uh, work with them and collaborate with them and uh, try to find some ways to work together. 
Now, at times, doctors working together are like trying to herd cats. Um, uh, doctors are very independent in their thinking. Uh, I think as time goes on, uh, we're getting more collaboration and you can't know enough about anything. So how to find good collaboration um, and having the, um, um, the, the fortitude to work as an individual or in collaboration. Some of the time says that maybe I wasn't always the world's biggest, best collaborator. Um, I think I know I do things better than you do. That's a bad, these advice is that how do you get the best of everything, how to collaborate better. So that's my advice. And uh, the politics of medicine, like anywhere else, is, is real and an entity. Uh, one of the things you're going to find is that um, society loves their doctors, but they can't afford their doctors. So how that's going to look, how the finances are, every year the finances are getting worse and worse. Uh, the satisfaction of brand new knowledge is, in, is increasing. There's so much more to learn right now. Uh, but how to, you know, put together a good practice of office, um, a hospital, combination of the above and lifestyle will be a challenge. And um, it's good to talk to people about that. And uh, everybody has some advice. So take, take the advice and make up your minds about that. Um, next slide, please. Um, this curiosity. I mean, um, I'm very curious and um, medicine allows that. Now, my son, is one, he said, Dad, I hate biology. I hate memorization. Um, and uh, I love physiology, how things work. He's an engineer. Things are logical. Um, and uh, medicine is not as logical as you think it is. And, uh, and the data doesn't always fit. And so um, the engineers in the world diff think different than the, um, than the doctors in the world. But there is some, obviously, degree of overlap. Uh, engineers work hard, doctors work hard, everybody works hard. Anybody who's successful works hard. Next slide, please, from running your own business. Um, okay. yeah. Dr. Kenny, so before we get to yep. this slide, I was wondering if we could open the floor for any questions and we can come yeah. back to the EPA slide. Sure. So um, I spent a lot of time talking. You guys are very quiet. Um, if, if you want to either show yourselves or unmute yourselves or whatever, ask any questions that uh, be glad to uh, tell you um, what I think. Um, I have an opinion on everything. I'm not sure it's the right opinion, but I do have an opinion and uh, love hearing what you guys have to say. Any thoughts from anybody? Hey, Dr. Kernu, just wanted to say hello. Hey, how uh, you doing? Yeah. Uh, I, th I thought you did a really good job with your talk. It was super interesting. I guess I had a question for you. Um, I, I guess if you could speak a little bit more what the transition was like going from like an in inpatient internist, like working in the hospital, and then when you first started like moving away and going more as an outpatient, and what like what made you, what was the decision like? Like why did you do that? And like how was the the transition? Yeah. So one of the things is that. Um, um, the hospitals have gotten to be very busy places and lengths of stay and discharges have become a priority. Um, and I always felt that um, uh, people in the hospital really didn't, uh, you know, my job was to get you out of hospital and package you up so like a mash unit, get you on your way and someone will after, look after things. Then the poor doctors in the outpatient settings don't know the detail or they have the, the knowledge that you have about that particular patient to put that together and they'll have to figure that out. Um, and uh, communication is getting harder and harder in medicine. Uh, I think these things called cell phones are wonderful ways of communicating with people. You know, you can put people's initials and you can get lots of information. And uh, at one time we used pagers and things of that nature and then you page, different lines. I, I, I think this is a wonderful way of communicating. Um, it would be nice if we're all on the same platform as time goes on. So I developed a big uh, outpatient practice over time. Um, and the hospital said, you know, hospitals, we don't want you to have a big outpatient. Go in the community um, and still work in the hospital. So you develop an outpatient practice. Um, and then, um, well, you can't leave your outpatient practice and it be in the hospital. And how do you do both? So I, I struggled with doing boats um, uh, for, for many years. Um, and, um, and eventually I had to make a choice. I couldn't do boats. And, um, and, and I, 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 did I make the right choice or not? I don't know. I love long-term relationships with people. I miss 
the in-hospital uh, acuteness of, of patients as well. Um, but I look at the, the burnout rates in different different people as well. You know, you, have I been burnt out in my career? Absolutely. Um, but um, like anything, you develop grit and you find solutions. So one of the things when I was, you know, felt burnt out, there was a, a something called a, I think pro comp or med pro, pro comp where you have the behavior uh, classes in the second year. We had I, I was assigned to I think ten medical students and a, a social worker. Um, I think I love the courses more than anybody. So half the students love it, half of them hate them. Um, um, I got to visit some, some shelters with some of our students and I got to see a different part of the world that would never done if I was just a pure clinician working in a hospital. Um, so that actually recharged my battery in that point in time. So, but I had to be available for a half a day for about a year and a half. And now, if you're on the medical teaching unit, you can't leave your practice for a half a day. You know, you're, there's nobody else to take your place. So um, I, I had to break the rules and get special permission to these sorts of things. They just don't fit well to do this. But um, I was, and I couldn't go to cardiology rounds on Tuesday mornings for a full um, uh, year and change because cardiology rounds were Tuesday mornings and ProComp was at, uh, during that on, on Tuesday mornings at that point in time. But it was a wonderful exploration. I really enjoyed it. I think I learned more about that behavior um, business. You know, physicians interrupted around 23 seconds into a conversation, patients supposed to tell their story. I'll tell you it works for some patients, but you get this um, verbal diarrhea for many patients, so many ideas you can't, you know, my brain has to process. So I have to tell you to be quiet for a second while I, while I process information. And so they can go on to the next point because you know your brain gets full, and um, and, and and some patients just want to just go on. They don't say anything that's important. Other times they say lots of important things. It's too much for you, so you have to learn to process things. So I think everybody has to find that point uh, what they like. And uh, I enjoyed the cuteness of patients being in a hospital. Uh, you know, you know, uh, one of the things I got to do was you know. Um, when I was a resident, being a, 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 um, a thrombolytic resident, my job was to be a, a, um, a GC resident. So I had to drop what I do and administer thrombolysis. Um, um, you know, for a cardiologist, that, um, that, that rush about being in a cath lab when an artery is totally occluded and you open it, or well, the first time a patient survives a cardiac arrest that you were part of, it's, it's a euphoric feeling. Um, and then you know solving a complex problem when it came to people is very, it's very satisfying. Um, but then people come out of hospital. What what happened in the hospital? I don't know. No one told me anything. I can't remember anything. Um, uh, people didn't explain that. Partially, it's true they didn't explain as well as they could have. And partially, patients forget. They just don't remember. They just remember fifteen percent. Um, and uh, so you know, how do you blend that together? And I think a to be a complete physician. That's why I chose initially internal medicine because um, I, I did general cardiology and general internal medicine. Um, uh, at the time, the general, Hamilton General Hospital, um, most of the internists weren't pure internists. They were uh, internists with a specialty. So Clive Davis, keep him alive. Clive, a, a superstar, was a respirologist intensivist. Um, Jim Nishikawa, who I work with in collaboration at that time as my partner, was a pure internist. So uh, and me as a cardiologist, I can, I can round in the CCU, I can round as an internist back then. You could not do that in this day and age. Um, um, uh, things have changed in, in many ways. And now in community settings, you do both because you have your office, you have your commitment to hospital. You often have a team of people um, to work with so people to cover your office. But it, it's, it's pretty hard right now to do that because office-based practice is, um, is a challenge. There's lots of expenses, there's lots of um, things to cover. It's just much harder. It's kind of, and a lot of people have just sort of um, worked in a group, have other people manage their practices um, and, um, or just be hospital-based, but I think you miss out so much. So uh, my, my wish to everybody is to experience both and, 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 and do a better job at blending it better than I could. Right now is that um, I'm predominantly in um, in my office. I spend some time reading some stress tests, and I go nuclear medicine department. Um, um, uh, but I do miss the other parts. But I also feel like uh, 
I can sleep at nighttime. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not being woken up at two o'clock in the morning anymore. Um, um, so I, th I think it's, you know, and I think if I just did one thing, if I just did cholesterol, I would be bored out of my mind after a while. If I just, you know, I admire people who can do just one thing very well. Some people are experts in osteoporosis, managing certain il illnesses and things of that nature. I kind of like the diversity of multiple systems. So I, I enjoy myself being a cardiologist that will manage your blood sugar, manage your renal function, manage your lung diseases. And um, so I feel like I'm more of a complete doctor in that way. And that's important to me to, to look at things. And yes, some, I'm a lousy neurologist, lousy hematologist, and I know where to get help, but uh, certain things I learned to manage. And, uh, and one of the things is to feel comfortable with you can manage and be able and say, listen, I don't know I need help. And the beauty about being a specialist, you can say this, uh, my, my focus is on this part, I can help you with this, but you know, I'm sorry for your, your pain management. Um, um, I really don't prescribe narcotics and uh, you need to speak to somebody else who knows more about this. Um, it's, a way, it's, a, it's a way out of, I, I sometimes feel sorry for the family doctors who need to know lots about everything. Um, I know uh, lots about very little and, um, and I still need to keep learning and uh, there's so much to learn and unlearn. Now, um, Paul, there was a book that talked about how to remember things. What's that book called? Uh, it's called Make It Stick. Um, and also we have a, we have a question for you as well in the in the chat. I can forward it for you. Um, so that well, there's actually okay. But we just read yeah, the book, make sure. it stick. I think we talked about that. That's a good book for people to look about that because you forget most of the things. But what's the next question? Go ahead. Yeah, please. Yeah. So um, it was actually it's is a two part question. The first part you already answered, or for the most part, unless you want to add more. It's what made you pick cardiology, and the second part is if you could touch on the transition from invasive to non invasive cardiology. I guess me knowing you now, you are very big on prevention. We just had a large talk on preventing um, uh, heart attacks in the first place and you've seen both sides of the coin. So um, how did you make that transition or why did you make that transition as well? So when, um, when I was at, uh, at uh, uh, finishing my second or third year, I went to a traditional medical school in McGill um, and basically, um, with subspecialty. So let me just sort of backtrack a little bit over here. So I think what I want to be when I grow up. Um, first of all, I'm never going to grow up and I want to keep learning and uh, I hope I'll keep young. So I thought about, um, you know, I like delivering babies. I got to deliver babies and that was kind of a fun thing to do. So do I want to be an obstetrician? Um, and I liked old people that want to be a geront gerontologist. I went to, to, to Yale to explore that a little bit. Um, I got to deliver babies with midwives in, in, in Northern Newfoundland. I kind of enjoyed that. I like kids. I want to be a pediatrician. Um, I hated neurology. I found all these stupid pathways that don't lead to many changes at the time. So yeah, neurology was very good at making a diagnosis but not changing outcome. Um, I chose initially internal medicine because it was so broad. I didn't have to pick something. I can pick the, the entire internal system from lungs, heart, kidneys, heart, and make it, and, and it gave me opportunity to, uh, to defer what to do. But then you meet people along the way that influence you. And um, we didn't have mentors back there, we, but we had people that were um, very smart and would share stories. So I remember trying to read an echo with this brand new cardiologist at, uh, at one of the Yale hospitals. And the, the, the technology he had there was a, was a bad echo machine and he was complaining about it. But he just sort of, we just chatted looking at echoes and all these things were fuzzograms. There's still fuzzograms now, but I understand the fuzz a lot better than I did uh, 35 years ago. Um, but he said, you know, you gotta follow your heart. What do you really wanna do? Um, um, I, I think that's really, you know, where do you feel more? And then, um, so to me, the transition went to that because at that time, cardiology was exploding. It was a transformative field. You, you know, at one time you had a heart attack, you put in a back room and you just were put to bed rest for, uh, for 30 days and you lived or you died. Now is that you're actively giving initial thrombolysis. And then, you know, cardiology didn't do an angioplasty for acute myocardial infarction. So I remember, uh, one of the interventions, a guy called Morish Michel, um, interventional cardiologist. And we were at this patient, I think it's some godly hour of the morning. 
and he was dying from a heart attack and the thrombolysis wasn't working. He said, let's go to the cat's lab. So we went to the cat's lab. This wasn't done back then. This was McMaster. And the chief of cardiology came, put his hand on my shoulder, son, we don't do this for heart attacks. You know what? This is what we do for heart attacks now. So that changed. And so, you know, and, uh, and some great people in this transformative field. Who would have thought that putting a, like a, a wire inside the heart and squishing a thing over, exploding a plaque with, you know, seven atmospheres would, would save a person's life without blowing up the artery? Um, and if you look at, you know, Mainson, who, dis, who uh, designed angiograms, you know, he took this wire, put it into his heart, and went upstairs to the thoracus to make sure the wire went in the right place. Um, you know, like, he experimented on that, and he did it himself for the first time. You know, like, you know, the, 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 the inventiveness, you know. So here at McMaster, everything goes into a clinical trial, it goes into this box, I say. It's not very inventive. We're, the people were in Connecticut were inventive people. They were just, you know, they're, they're Einsteins to me. They were, they were thinking at different levels, trying to come up with new solutions. If you look at healthcare today, is that uh, uh, we have a long ways to go. And uh, I really enjoy my clinic because I have a lot of young people that have been truly transformative that really come up with new ideas. So we do these webinars on, uh, on a Friday night. And the thing that gives me the great joy is to see young people you know, learn new skills and present and do such a fantastic job. And I just get to watch it. And, um, and hopefully that will teach a few patients uh, uh, a few things. So to me, the, the joy is watching other people succeed and medicine allows you for your patients to succeed and for the, the, the people around you to succeed. The challenge is right now is that most people don't want to do what's necessary to be healthy. And how do we motivate and change that? So I don't know how to do that yet, but I'm going to keep trying. Um, and, um, and so I'll keep working that direction. So uh, to me is that it's just trying new things. And with, with Pat's, you know, I became, um, I went to Yale because of an accident. Um, uh, I became a cardiologist because I enjoyed the field and I met some very impressionable people I got to talk to that were cardiologists that took the time to talk and ask questions. To be honest, um, if I met a, a pediatrician or obstetrician that was passionate about what they're doing and opened some doors, I might have changed that pathway to that too as well. I think I would have been happy in multiple areas. Um, but this, the, 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 the two cardinal rules to me is do something useful and be where you're needed. And I, I think that is, is so important to, to always consider that. Um, I've been to Africa, not doing much in the way of medical work, but doing other types of work. And I'm impressed with doctors. Like I wish I was a surgeon sometimes and be able to go operate and restore sight or, or something uh, uh, in, 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 in people in, in Africa. They don't need a preventive cardiologist in Africa at this stage. Um, they need clean water and better, and you know, they need more, more surgical procedures and things of that nature. And uh, so um, Northern Canada is a place that needs to be explored with um, uh, our native population. They're in trouble. What we can do to help in that area. Um, um, you know, most of us end up in big cities and things of that nature. I'm not sure big cities are the place that we're most useful right now. Where, you know, uh, to me, I, um, if I was going to launch a career, I'd think of more rural practices right now where you can actually, uh, you know, do multiple things and learn new skills and work with people in those areas. Um, um, but then you have to think about your family and, you know, where your kids are going to go to school and places like that. And um, um, to be honest, to, to, I don't care if I'm a, a is a, um, a nice house or a bad house. Um, I just want a clean house that's close to the hospital. Um, you know, when we decided to buy a house on a farm, we had to be 30 minutes or closer to being able to go to the hospital. So that was a defining moment where you live and things of that nature. Um, uh, but I just ended up growing up on uh, in um, a 50 acre farm, watching my kids play with, you know, animals and have all the open spaces was, was, was beautiful. And, um, uh, and I think my, and I had a very supportive wife uh, who would say, you know, if you can't make it, I'll, I'll find a way of being there. Um, but also has its demands too as well. When our um, second son was born, I couldn't find any way to cover my practice. So I had to run back and forth between the delivery back and forth and go to the hospital and back and forth. And, uh, you know, uh, is that fair? I don't know. That's just the way it is. And, you know, you just have to do these sorts of things. Um, so it's, it's been a, it's 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 been um, 
and, and my wife says I live in Disney World because I, I remember certain things in certain ways and things of nature. But there's, 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 there's a lot of hard moments in this. And, um, you know, when to let go of certain things or not, I don't know. Um, um, and uh, are there regrets? I think the only thing you regret are things you haven't tried. So try different things. Um, you know, try exploring different different places. One of the things right now with this pandemic, it makes it hard for you to to, to see patients. But God, I mean, the beauty of medicine is seeing patients, either virtually or in person. And virtual medicine is being is going to be transformed that that blend right now. So learn how to do that better, um, and and try to get as many experiences as you can with as many different people. Um, and if you find something that works, um, um, work with that player in some way. Um, um, but that's the best I can tell you. I think that's a great, very detailed answer, like Sabrina said as well, and very insightful. Um, we are approaching our time, Dr. Kearney, so 9.30. Um, uh, there's some contact information for everyone on the screen there if you want to contact Dr. Kearney or the cardiology, cardiac surgery interest group. Um, if you have any questions or if anyone wants the slides or anything, we can provide those as well. Uh, any last words, Dr. Kearney? Why don't you go to the next slide there? So let me just, so, um, so, this, actually, so this is actually um, uh, our, our YouTube channel. So first of all, this, this channel would not exist if it wasn't for Paul. So Paul, I was like, I'm not quite sure when that was, but he said, um, we should do something on YouTube. And um, I said, okay, what do we do? And he started to organize and we all worked a team. And right now uh, we have over a hundred and... Um, 50 videos. Uh, we do a live one every Friday um, and we have some pre-recorded ones. Everybody says I'm too long-winded. I am too long-winded. Um, and uh, I don't think you can, I don't, I don't think you can summarize healthcare in um, 30 seconds. At least I haven't been able to do that. But I'm really proud of watching people create different aspects of health. Um, and uh, I'm I was talking to um, a couple of high school teachers. So they do their Zoom classes. They record absolutely nothing because they're not allowed to record kids on a Zoom call where university classes are recorded. It makes no sense to me. You learn by repetition, by digesting, going back and forth and looking at something. And did, did, you know, you, you learn about this. So this is actually something that, um, uh, that not enough people use. Uh, it has good information. It's too long, but it's well done. And um, people are learning and the, and the world's getting better. So it's just one way of doing things. Um, and if you go, go, go to the EPA one there, that EPA slide. Now, I'm is so fascinating about fish oils right now, right now is that uh, uh, I know that some of us got to work with Dr. Hegley who made triglyceride. Uh, he, you know, he simplifies the most difficult concept. He's a wonderful teacher. He's probably the smartest guy when it comes to genetics and lipids. He hasn't figured it out yet. And uh, so a mere mortal like myself, uh, who's been thinking about this, is that um, is the story about fish oils, fish seem to be a healthy food. Um, but who would have thought that the combination of DHNA would counterbalance themselves in some way? The final picture is not out right now, but it looks like EPA stabilizes membranes. It works as an antioxidant at the tissue level. It prevents oxidation of LDL cholesterol. When you add DHA, the other component of fish, it negates many of those benefits. They both lower C-reactive protein markers of inflammation. They both lower remnant particles, but they don't prevent atherosclerosis to the same degree. And maybe we're gonna find out that DHA is good for the brain. And so I can give you a randomized trial of a McMaster approved only 175 patients, so small trials that giving DHA supplements makes your computer skills a little bit faster, your, 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 your mentation a little bit faster, and that may translate to better cognition. Um, and the ophthalmologists like to have vitamin cocktails and things of that nature, but uh, I don't know that literature well enough yet, but I'm going to explore that. And I'm learning biochemistry again. Um, and but I'm quite, I'm quite um, fascinated uh, about the story. And if you go back to basic principles, oxidizable LDL cholesterol is a 
big component of the atherosclerotic plaque. And maybe pure EPA helps with that and the combination of DHA and EPA doesn't. Now, we still, the final chapter is not there, but this is what it looks like right now. And uh, I think it's a fascinating story. So if you go back to that, that other slide, how do you bring this concept to um, a patient um, and those videos and things that nature? So it's not a simple answer anymore, um, but it's so nice to, to, to look at this and, uh, and, and to work together on this. So, you know, what we do is to help people. Um, and um, the more people you can have in this type of communication, the fact that this is recorded, the fact that this is recorded, I hope you go back and, and, and look at that. And, uh, and if I can help you in any way, uh, I, I'd be, be more, more of a pleasure. As you get older towards your career, uh, you're not, one, of, one of the things that makes people like me happy is to see younger people become successful. And, and if we can help in any way, we'd be very glad to, to do this. Um, uh, but, um, you know, how to balance life balance. Um, I don't know how to do that well. Um, um, it's been a, a wonderful journey so far. Um, and um, and provided I can still be useful, um, I wanna keep going and, um, and we'll see what happens. But I hate running an office. Um, 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 I just like to see patients and, and try to set, how to set that up and you know, I'll give you an example is that uh, my I, our echo pack machine is, is full and it's based on Windows 7 and to fix the problem is it's going to cost a hundred thousand uh, dollars because you have to get new equipment so there you go so um, you know the business aspect of medicine is, is a challenge um, uh, is that is it, but the you know and it looks like a high EPA level, um, without DHA, it's good for the heart. So there you go. So how, how do you balance all that together? And then um, I'm supposed to be at a tennis game on, on Friday morning at seven o'clock in the morning during clinic time. So I won't be able to make that tennis game, but uh, that's okay. We'll do something else and we'll have it for your time. And um, so there's just, just, just so many things to balance and to learn. And uh, so I think I'll stop here. And any other questions there, Paul or anybody else? Oh, it looks good. I think uh, I think it's a good time to wrap up or a good place to wrap up as well. So I'd just like to thank you, Dr. Cooney, for uh, your time and your presentation. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, this will be recorded and I will be posting it as well. And if anyone wants uh, to contact us, please don't hesitate. Well, listen, I bid you all good night and, and enjoy your career. This is an exciting time. There's so much to learn. Keep learning and um, make a difference. Thank you so much. And a lot of thanks and praise coming in through the chat. So thanks, Dr. Kernu. Always great to see you. Good to see everybody.